But the husband is one of these David Hogg beta males who is opposed <laughs> to guns. How do you counsel that couple? I look the guy straight in the eyes and tell him to grow up here. <laughs> <laughs> and that's in Hezekiah 36, right? Yes. Yes. And the Lord saith, grow up here. <laughs> Bringing you law, gospel, and guns. Welcome to Armed Lutheran Radio. Welcome to Armed Lutheran Radio, a show about guns, hunting, competition, and the natural right of self-defense and what God's Word says about the issues surrounding gun rights and gun ownership. I'm your host, Lloyd Bailey, the Armed Lutheran, and this is episode number 140, brought to you by Cook's Holsters, American-made custom Kydex holsters with a lifetime warranty and a 100% satisfaction guarantee, cooksholsters.com. Again, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for making Armed Lutheran Radio a part of your week. I really uh, I apologize for the delay this week, but uh, it was a rough weekend. I shot the True Glow North Texas IDPA Regional Championship on Saturday. Started feeling poorly after the meal, after the match. Did not feel well Saturday night and most of the day on Sunday. So uh, just was not in uh, any kind of condition to sit behind the microphone and, and uh, sound happy and excited. I just did not feel well, so decided to delay the release. Before um, we get started, let me talk about the match. I did absolutely nothing to get ready for the match. Uh, it was at my home range in White Wright, Texas, uh, about 40 minutes from here. I swore I was going to dry fire every night leading up to the match, but I didn't. It just didn't happen. So, the results were predictable. I think I finished uh, somewhere in the middle of the pack in um, ESP Sharpshooter. Hats off to match director Bora Angel for his uh, first sanctioned match. He put on a great match, interesting props, um, fun stages, great staff. Like I said, the staff were great. The facility is awesome. Uh, thanks to Kevin Harding, the owner of the of the range, who's done tons of improvements. And it looks like we're going to be hosting our state match uh, next year as well. Really, really proud of of my um, of my home club, Collin County IDPA, and my home range, Mission One Hundred and Sixty, for putting together such an awesome match. Um, Team Armed Lutheran Radio was there. Uh, Sergeant Bill and Sergeant Mrs. Sergeant Bill. Uh, I got to meet Jackie and Joey Russo from Federal Way, Washington. I uh, met uh, teammate Steve Sheeman for the first time. Uh, Sergeant Bill won high law enforcement and uh, was SSP division champion. So congratulations to Sergeant Bill. And thank you to Cook's Holsters for supporting the team. Um, like I said, I was somewhere in the middle of the pack in ESP Sharpshooter. I've really got to get back in shape. I'm working on it, but uh, it's been slow since uh, surgery and trying to sort of figure out how things are, are working now without a gall gallbladder, but, uh, getting better, but I just got to get back in shape and, and get back in, in regular practice before I try another sanction match. It'll probably be, you know, I would love to shoot the fall brawl in a couple of weeks, but I, I don't think that's going to happen. So maybe December at the battle of the boondocks, but, uh, in Mississippi, but we'll see. But as I'm recording this, I'm having a cup of West Rock coffee Sweetened with progressive tears, because this weekend, while I was shooting the North Texas Regional IDPA Championship, the Senate voted to confirm Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court. It was a 50 to 48 vote, I believe. The awful, disgusting tactics of the left failed to prevent the confirmation of a second Trump nominee to the court, but many on the right went right along with them. Retiring Arizona Senator Jeff Fake called uh, Flake, sorry. Uh, called for yet another last-minute FBI investigation, which did nothing but confirm that the whole thing was a joke um, and just served to 
delay things again, which was really the uh, the purpose of uh, having the um, uh, the investigation in the first place. Alaska's Lisa Murky Murkowski, uh, scared to death after being cornered by Diane Feinstein and freaked out by, I guess, women shrieking women voters, decided to abstain. Um, to all of our friends in Alaska, do whatever you can to get rid of Lisa Murkowski. You need to send her packing. Hats off to Senator Lindsey Graham, though. Not one of my favorite senators, but he's found his spine. Or maybe he got, like the predator, he ripped the spine out of Lisa Murkowski and Jeff Flake, and, and now he's now he's up for confronting the left. The left, predictably, this week after the vote, um, went into full meltdown mode, and it's been glorious to watch. Through all this mess, all of the investigations and all of the hearings and all of the BS, all of the protests, Democrats failed to stop the nomination. They erased their lead in the polls. They took a hacksaw to the Me Too movement by basically proving that the whole thing is just about politics and not about women. They've undermined feminism by unmasking it as anti-men. And they showed themselves and the entire party to be despicably evil partisans willing to destroy good people in front of their wives and children and the whole world just to score political points. Scott Adams of um, Dilbert fame uh, said on his podcast this week that he thinks the protests are, what did he call it, um, cathartic theater. They're powerless to change things. They don't like th the way things are. So it makes them feel good to go out and protest. But I fear that it's, it's worse, that the civil unrest we see is going to get worse. And the political climate in this country, I think, is only going to get worse. Um, do I see a civil war coming? No, I don't. Mainly because the left hates guns and it would be a really short civil war. Um, but what I see next is more civil unrest spurred on by the media and Democrat donors, an attempt to undermine and discard the foundations of the republic. Um, that's coming, and it's already started, actually. Alexandria Occasional Cortex decided that she wants to get rid of the Electoral College, but let's face it, every time Democrats lose, they call for an end to the Electoral College. Um, they did this in 2000. They did it in 2004. They did it immediately after Trump won in 2016. So this is really nothing new. But what is new is some are actually calling for the end of the Senate itself, mainly because the left is doesn't like the institutions that our founders created because it, it limits the power of the mob. It limits the power of the government. They don't like that. So they want to throw away the Senate because it's not democratic. Because we, Wisconsin and or Wyoming and one of these small states, Rhode Island, has the same number of senators as California. It's like we live in a federal republic or something where all the states have equal representation. Who knew, right? Basically, if you can't win, then you got to change the game. Democrats lost in 2016 because of who they are and what they represent. But they still think that they're appealing to people for some reason. They just have to do more of what they've been doing. They just haven't been doing enough. They haven't been confrontational enough. They haven't been crazy enough. So don't be less confrontational. Don't be less crazy and unhinged. Don't be less hateful and angry. Don't be less corrupt. Don't be moderate. If you can't win, change the game. Just keep doing what you've been doing and change the game. That's what the future holds. A fight for the foundations of our republic. They've been calling for voters to harass Republicans in their private lives now. Now, we've seen this for a while. Maxine Waters uh, was one of the first. We saw it with Sarah uh, uh, Huckabee Sanders. But now they're actually, you've got members of Congress actually calling for this stuff to happen. Uh, they're paying people to do it, too. I mean, go look at what happened in the elevator to Jeff Flake. That was a complete setup. Or in Hatch, Mitch McD McConnell has been confronted and screamed at. Um, Ted Cruz and his, his wife confronted and screamed at in a restaurant. They're sending videos of beheadings to the wives of GOP congressmen. Rand Paul's wife admitted this week that she sleeps with a gun because she's worried about the left. Congress people like Maxine Waters continue to encourage this nonsense. And now Hillary Clinton, thinking that she can make herself relevant again, 
has joined this parade. She said recently that you can't be civil with Republicans. We can be civil once Democrats are back in power. Right. Like they were civil during the Obama administration or when she was working in her husband's administration to personally destroy people, to smear political opponents and women who came out and suggested that they had been assaulted by Bill Clinton. Rather than believe the women, she personally led the effort to destroy them. The politics of personal destruction was born in the Clinton administration, driven by Hillary Clinton. Whatever kind of justice Brett Kavanaugh makes of himself, no matter what actually happened 35 years ago when he was in high school, the Senate's vote restored the intention of the founders. The presumption of innocence is key to our system of justice. The fact that they want to throw that out is really frightening. And if you're an African-American listening to this and you typically vote Democrat, you might want to think again about voting for the party of Believe the Women. How would you like it if now we're going to institutionalize the idea that you're guilty until proven innocent? If, if the complaint of the minority community in this country is about police treatment of minorities and police brutality, do you really want to support a party that wants to make you guilty you know, without any evidence that you, and, and force you to prove yourself innocent? Do you really want that system? I don't think so. So I would think twice about voting Democrat from now on. The fact that so many Democrats were willing to throw away this foundational aspect of our system of justice is scary. And it's harmful to those who are real victims of abuse. It's harmful to those who are wrongly accused, particularly in our minority community. Like I just said, it's awful for the American people. The Democrat Party has become a hive of scum and villainy as Obi-Wan Kenobi said a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And I can only pray that this comes back to bite them in next month's election, because it really should. All right, enough of that. You've been waiting long enough for this week's episode. It's time to get on with the show, which we will do right after this message. You're listening to Armed Lutheran Radio, a proud member of the Self-Defense Radio Network. Let me take a minute to tell you a little bit about our good friends at G4G Guns. After surviving an attempted kidnapping and having co-workers robbed at gunpoint, Patrick and Cassie Coburn decided to get a gun for protection, and that led them to teach others about the need to protect themselves and to be proficient with firearms, and that led to the creation of G4G Guns. It's an amazing store and an even more amazing website where you can shop for any gun, ammunition, accessories, from the comfort of your own home and buy without any gimmicks or credit card fees. If you want the personal touch, visit their store at 175 Bear Road in Van Alstine, Texas, or stop by and see them at a gun show near you on the weekends. They're great people. They offer great service, great prices, an amazing selection, and no hidden fees or gimmicks. Check them out at g4gguns.com. That's g, the number four, gguns.com. G4G Guns, the galaxy for great guns. G4Gguns.com. Up next, it's Mia's Motivations with Mia Anstein. Hey, you guys, how's it going? I hope you have been doing really super duper fabulous. I've been doing pretty good. I spent most of the end of August and most of September in the mountains, in the wilderness, hunting elk with my bow, and I am currently headed down to Texas to the She Never Quit event, which I mentioned in a past episode, and I'll be teaching archery down there. Before I had headed up on the hunt, or actually I guess it was in the middle of the hunt, one of the times that I got to come home. I had shared on my website on miaanstein.com a book that I was going to start reading, and it's called Yes, I Hunt. It's by Dawn Overbrecht, and she is a doctor that I met at another ladies' shooting event up in Steamboat, Colorado, back in 2012 or sometime around there. It was a long time ago. I took the book with me to hunting camp, and whenever I had a chance, I read 
I'm going to be doing a review of the book on my website. I've asked some friends if they have read the book, and so far, nobody's had as much time to read as me because I had no internet up there, so I wasn't on Facebook or social media. So I had plenty of time to read, which actually I enjoy reading. With this book, it's called One Woman's Hunting Adventure is her subtitle, but she actually used to be a vegetarian who became a hunter. So that story is very interesting It to me. It's interesting to see her point of view in the hunting journey because I grew up in a hunting family and I know there are some people who did, some people who didn't, and there's also all different styles of hunting. So for me reading the book, it's a very different style than what I'm used to and I had to kind of check that as I was reading because some of the things weren't really what we call ethical in our area. So... I had to remember that different people hunt different ways, but also as a hunter ed instructor, which I am, there are a few things in there that made me want to share another reminder with you if you're going to start hunting. And one of those is you need to take binoculars with you on a hunt. You've got to have optics on your hunt and not just on top of your rifle. Never, ever use your rifle scope as a binocular. So if you're on a hunt and you see an animal in the distance, you do not raise your rifle to identify the animal because, as you know, just as in handgun and shotgun, any firearms, we know the rules of firearm safety, and we do not point our firearms at anything that we don't intend to destroy. So if you raise your gun and you're looking through the scope, you know what your barrel is pointing at is whatever you're looking at through the scope. So please, please always remember that you need optics and do not use your scope as a binocular. Take separate binoculars. Also, I hope that you have read some good books. I have books from the book club at church and it's always fun to get ideas so if you have ideas let us know over at the reformation gun club i like hearing what other people enjoy so i'd love to hear any good books that you have read this one as i mentioned yes i hunt by don overbrecht md it's a great starter for people who are wanting to get into hunting and it's a great point of view of how a vegetarian becomes a hunter. This is a book that I'm not sponsored. A lot of the products that I mentioned, I am not sponsored by these people. I purchased this book. I do have a recipe in there. And when I met Dawn, she's messaged me over the years and she asked if I had any game recipes. So there is a wild game recipe in there that is from Mia's Kitchen and she shares some of these recipes. So it's definitely something if you're interested in understanding hunting more, you can pick up that book and I'd be happy to hear your thoughts about it. Until next time. Bye guys. You can read more from Mia and watch her YouTube videos at MiaAnstein.com. Hey guys, it's Mia here. If you follow me on social media, you know that I often share morning inspiration. Many people ask how I can keep this up every day. Well, it starts with my morning readings and that perfect cup of coffee. The official Dunkin' Donuts shop provides coffee lovers with everything they need, from K-Cup Pods, original blended coffee, tea, drinkware, and more. Who doesn't want Dunkin' delivered to their front door? Shop today at www.com armedlutheran.us slash coffee and help support Arm Lutheran Radio today. Time now for another Ballistic Minute with Sergeant Bill Sylvia. Hey everybody, this is Sergeant Bill with your Ballistic Minute. So this morning I'm getting ready to go shoot the North Texas Regional IDPA match in White Ride, Texas. Don't really have a tip for you, but maybe I do. How about getting ready for a sanctioned match? So the night before, check your range bag, go through it, make sure you have everything you need, get your mags loaded, and then set your clothes out and everything that you're going to have for the next day to include your vest, because you don't want to forget that, and that way, when you get up in the morning, you can have some coffee, hopefully like me, in your armed Lutheran radio mug, and you can just get ready to go shoot and have fun. So, have fun. I'm Sergeant Bill. This is your Ballistic Minute.
Sergeant Bill Sylvia is a veteran of the Dallas Police Department and master class competitive shooter. You can watch Sergeant Bill's shooting videos at armedlutheran.us forward slash Sergeant Bill. Hey there, this is Sergeant Bill. After the successful completion of a match, Lloyd and I like to get together and top it off with a celebratory cigar. We get our post-match cigars from Cigar Page, home of America's best cigar deals. Visit armedlutheran.us slash cigar and get a great deal. And also, help support Armed Lutheran Radio. Let me take a moment to tell you about our good friends at cooksholsters.com. Not only are they a sponsor of the show and the Armed Lutheran Radio shooting team, they're a company that I trust and believe in. Why? Well, when I first got into concealed carry, when I got my concealed carry permit, it was really amazing how much I didn't know. I picked up a holster from my local range, one of those cheap prophylactic holsters, you know the kind, they collapse when you take the gun out, you can't reholster them safely. I have to admit, Admit, I was one of those guys. When I started learning more and taking classes and reading and watching videos, I found out that there are better holsters out there. I learned about the advantage of Kydex holsters, and that's how I discovered Cook's holsters. What makes Cook's so special as opposed to other holster makers? They make an outstanding product. They sell printed Kydex to many of the other holster makers, and their subsidiary business, Cook's Molds, actually makes the molds that other holster manufacturers use. Cook's holsters is an American success story. Born in the founder's basement, Cook's holsters grew so much that Mr. Cook left his job to make holsters full-time, and he hired people to help fill orders and meet demand. Custom molded to fit your firearm, Cook's holsters are available in a wide array of colors and printed patterns, including your own artwork. They're available for carry, for range work, and for competition. Check them out at cooksholsters.com. They're adding new gun models every month. I trust them for everyday carry and for competition competition. Visit them today. Use the promo code ARMEDPODCAST and save 15% off your order. They offer a lifetime warranty and a 100% money back guarantee if you're not satisfied. Check them out at cooksholsters.com. Up next, we're clinging to God and guns with Pastor John Bennett. Welcome back to Armed Lutheran Radio. Time now for Clinging to God and Guns, where we take a critical look at the moral and ethical issues surrounding gun rights and gun ownership. We're joined, as always, by the pastor at St. John's Lutheran Church in Willow Creek, Minnesota, Pastor John Bennett. Pastor, welcome back. Thank you, Lloyd. Good to be back, even in the midst of this crazy world we live. (laughs) I went and scrubbed all the... uh, uh, references to beer from my social media. Just to make sure. <laughs> <laughs> but this week, uh, this week's topic, we have uh, Rick Ector to thank uh, for today's story. Rick is a firearms instructor and a Second Amendment advocate from Detroit, Michigan. We met him back in episode ninety of uh, last year. Uh, He posted on Facebook this week a story about how a man who had uh, signed up for one of Rick's classes had uh, withdrawn because his wife did not want a gun in the house. And that reminded me of an article that I wrote back in the uh, 2014 BP, that would be before podcast. It was a response to a reader who had sent me an email asking a serious question about guns and his anti-gun wife. She was afraid of guns and wanted uh, some advice on, on, you know, whether arguing he wanted a gun, she didn't. And he wanted to know what uh, my advice would be to, for dealing with that situation. That uh, article is not available in full anymore unless you buy the book. Here I blog. So I thought we'll, we'll go through it uh, here. We use those two stories as sort of the springboard for today's episode. How, as a Christian, do we approach the issue of guns and home defense when your spouse disagrees with your position on guns? So I wanted to start by reading this article or this letter from the article. Um, As a Christian and a member of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, he began, uh, I'm seeking your advice. I'm a resident of a right to carry state. I was all set to purchase a pistol where I would take the necessary classes to train and how to use it. My father was a police officer and my best friend is in law enforcement. So I've been around guns my entire life. Unfortunately, my wife who is quite left of center 
is completely against my purchase of said pistol. She laid down the hammer last week and refuses to talk about it. Uh, I should mention that we have a 20 month old and my wife is all but certain will, uh, she will somehow get a hold of it and well, you get the idea. So as a conservative Lutheran, how would you recommend I deal with my wife on this issue? I can see her point. I would never allow my daughter to be harmed yet. If I lock it up and take all the classes, if I'm responsible, what's the big deal? Um, in your opinion, is it worth quote unquote, going to the mattresses over this issue? Do you really have to carry a gun around to protect your family? And pastor, let's take that last question first, before we get into the bigger one, do you have to carry a gun? Do you have to own a gun to protect your family? Is pastor Steven Anderson, right? That Luke 22 commands us to have two guns or, uh, <laughs> or not. <laughs> Um, not only are you, do you have to have two guns, but you have to have the shovel attachment on your AR. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so that when you're out hiking, you can, uh, that's right. When nature calls, you can take care of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and, and this goes, uh, hand in hand with the last segment when we revisited questions, uh, regarding, you know, Romans 13 and the government and our civil responsibilities and so forth, that we are obligated as Christian men to protect and care for our wife and children. Mm -hmm. And we don't have a requirement alongside with that to, to be prepared to defend their lives with lethal force in any situation. You know, and again, if that were the requirement, then that would say that all those godly husbands out there who who fear God and and take their faith seriously would be somehow sinning by not owning firearms. Right, right. So we're ne we're we're neither as we've said many times we're neither commanded nor forbidden from owning a firearm. We'll get back to that in a moment. Let's look at the biblical view of marriage and God's design for men and women. It, it, it all starts in Genesis, and then the relationship is sort of solidified in the Sixth Commandment, right? Yeah, you could say that, yeah. You know, one, one thing that's very interesting is that when you look at the fall into sin, that, you know, the the curse to the woman and the man is, is that um, he says that your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. And that's what most English translations have. It's not the best translation in the world. The indication in the Hebrew is that your desire will be to have your husband's authority, but you will never get it because he will be the one in authority over you. And so right from the beginning, one of the consequences of sin is the power struggle that exists between husband and wife. Um, now, if you, if you live under grace, if you if you live as a forgiven and redeemed people of God, that power struggle is replaced by love and compassion. But the natural consequence of sin is that um, conflict will flow in your relationships. Um, so, yeah, that it's it's interesting because you know we see that dynamic, and then we we get up to um, Colossians three eighteen. We get into Ephesians chapter five, where it describes the relationship between husband and wife as the wives being submissive. Mm -hmm. But I, I would warn anyone who is having conflict in your marriage or even, you know, a, a slight disagreement over the necessity to own firearms and have them in the home. That if you start out your argument with the Bible says, you have to submit to me, you've already <laughs> lost. <laughs> Exactly. Let's not uh, let's not make things worse. Um, this this goes back to also we talked about this in a previous episode and in, in the episode about our relationship with government. This is also something that that um, is discussed or sort of laid out for us in the table of duties. Um, and we've discussed this before, but for those who are not familiar with the Lutheran confessions, can you explain the, the table of duties, what they are, where we find them? Yeah, the table of duties, it's the, the last section in the catechism after the section on prayers. And the table of duties is a brief scripture reference for 
our responsibilities as the people of God, um, deals with our relationships, you know, with, you know, what the hearers owe to their pastor. It deals with what citizens owe to the government, what children owe to their parents and so forth. And it, it provides a very good brief scripture reference for anyone who's looking to see what God's word says about how they ought to live their life, how they ought to be responsible people in society and so forth. Right. And that's the key. It's, it's a, it's not for those who would say, well, you're looking at something outside the Bible. This isn't extra biblical. This is, this is a summary of what scripture says about our relationships. Right. Right. Yeah. If, if you're saying the table of duties is extra biblical, then I would have to uh, <laughs> question what translation of the Bible you're using, because I'm pretty sure that all those passages that are referenced there are included in the scriptures. Exactly. So what is the what does the table of duties say about wives and where do we find those um references in scripture and then what does it say about husbands and our responsibilities towards our wives Well I actually just happened to have my catechism right here so let me open it up You came prepared Well not that I was prepared to pull out my catechism but it just happened to be about 3 feet from my desk so uh <laughs> The instruction to husbands, it says, Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life, so that nothing will hinder your prayers from 1 Peter 3, verse 7. And then from Colossians three nineteen, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. So that's what it says to husbands, you know, and that last part I would, I would really impress upon husbands out there. Don't be harsh with your wife. When you disagree, be gentle, be compassionate, be loving, explain everything from the perspective of this is all coming from a position of desiring to care for you as my wife. Um, to wives, Luther includes in Ephesians 5.22 and 1 Peter 3, 5 through 6. He says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And we'll get into that a little bit later. I wanted to go over uh, that passage in a little more detail at, at some point here uh, in the segment. And then in 1 Peter 3, 5 through 6, they were submissive to their own husbands like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. So... Uh, wives, if you're not referring to your husband as master, you're sinning. Um, kidding, kidding. Uh, this this podcast will surely be dug up if I'm ever nominated to the Supreme Court. Um, <laughs> that in your ice throwing episode will will not do you well in the in the hearings. <laughs> as long as I'm not standing anywhere near the punch bowl, I'm okay. Right. <laughs> So, so God's word tells us that the husband's the head of the household, that wives are to be submissive. Sounds a lot like husband's word goes and damn the torpedoes, go right ahead and get that gun, right? Yeah, I wouldn't do it if I were you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and here's, here is some practical advice. You know, if, if these are things that you care about, things like firearm ownership, um, you know, and I like the advice that Ben Shapiro gives when it comes to dating, that you're, you're dating for marriage, that look at your, the woman that you are, you know, of course, if you're already married, you know, that, that ship has sailed. But um, when, when you are getting to know one another, these things that are important to you, find out where she stands on these issues because it might make a difference on whether or not you decide you want to spend the rest of your life with them. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had, you know, my situation is somewhat similar to the examples that you gave at the beginning that, um, you know, when, when I first started dating my wife, um, I, I knew she was a conservative Christian. We never really talked about guns because my interest in firearms didn't come about until I was in seminary uh, by the time that we were already engaged. When I found out that she was very much opposed to firearms, um, and her reason for that is because she, the the only really exposure she had to them is when she was... 
I believe she was in high school, uh, maybe junior high. Um, a friend of hers or someone that she knew in her youth group had had a party. His father had left a loaded firearm that he had access to. He didn't know it was loaded. He was playing around with it with some friends of his and accidentally shot and killed himself. So that was the only frame of reference that she had for firearms. And um, when I bought my first firearm, I was in seminary. And, um, you know, some people would say that, you know, this, uh, I should have just said the hell with it and, and not even told her about it. But because this is the woman I'm going to spend the rest of my life with, I had the discussion with her. And at the end of the discussion, she said, you know, I'm not terribly comfortable with you doing this, but as long as you're promising to be responsible, um, you know, you, you do what you want. Um, sometimes when your wife says, do what you want, um, <laughs> there's an implied, it means, means. yes. <laughs> <laughs> what she really means is I expect you to do what I want you to do. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, it, the, the big turning point was when I took her to shoot. Mm -hmm. Um, I was on Vicarage she asked me, what do you want to do for your birthday? And with a mischievous grin on my face, I said, let me take you shooting. Um, and uh, she did, you know, and, um, and she, she actually enjoyed it. You know, we went over the safety rules and everything. And um, what a lot of this stems from, if you really want to be or to have any success in convincing your spouse or getting her to acquiesce to your desire to purchase a firearm and keep it in the home and, you know, God forbid, conceal carry, um, <laughs> that uh, it it's all about how you approach the subject with her. The picture of marriage that we're given in the, in the scriptures is this one flesh relationship. And, you know, this is, uh, this is also, I guess we could call this our first uh, marriage counseling episode. Um, <laughs> that the, the idea with this one flesh union is that if my desire is to care for my wife, first and foremost, and by extension of that, our children as well, and her desire first and foremost, is to care for me, our relationship is going to be strong and healthy because our desire is to make the other feel appreciated, loved, cared for. Mm -hmm. If your focus is primarily on yourself, you're in trouble. Um, so the way that I would approach this, you know, you, you go to your wife and say, you know, I care for you deeply. I don't know what I would do without you or our children. If you have children, um, part of my desire to care for you and protect you includes my strong feeling that we need to be able to protect one another, or I need to be able to protect you uh, against an armed intruder or, you know, whatever situation you want to throw out there, make it a plausible situation. You know, if, Right. If, if you live in a lily white neighborhood, you know, you, you can't use the uh, example of, you know, 15 MS-13 thugs banging down your door and coming into your house. So, <laughs> Be, <laughs> But, you know, approach it from the position that this it comes from your deep desire to care for your wife. Um you know, it, it helps to be knowledgeable on the statistics, the statistics, both of actual homicide rates with firearms, actual accidental deaths with firearms, compared to those incidents every year that take place where a firearm is used in self-defense. Um, to ask her to take a class with you, you know, to, to learn some of the uh, concepts of gun safety and how to use a firearm in a responsible way. You're going to get a lot further than saying, dear, you must submit to me. Right. Right. So a quick summary here uh, before the next big question. If so, uh, the husband's the head of the house, the wife is supposed to submit. 
he's to love and honor his wife. If he desires a firearm to protect his wife because he loves her, is it a good idea? Would he be dishonoring her by going ahead and buying the gun against her wishes? What is what that? And then conversely, if she refuses to allow him to, um, to, to do this, would she be sinning by refusing to submit? One question at a time there. <laughs> let's let's take the first that that if his his wife is strongly opposed to it is is he sinning by going and buying that firearm? Um, you know, strictly speaking from a biblical perspective, no, it wouldn't be sinning to do that, but would it be good for your marriage? Right. Would it would it be something that is conducive to building trust with your spouse, or would it destroy the trust that you have built so far? Um, conversely, you know, when it comes to wives, if if the husband desires this and the wife is fiercely opposed to it, uh, is is it sin on her part to be fiercely opposed to it? Um, to the point that she is willing to undermine her husband. Um, I, yes, you could strictly say that is is sin. I'm I'm a little hesitant to say that, just because you know at the same time we need to be considerate of our wife's feelings on this. Uh, we mm-hmm. can't we can't run roughshod over her opinions. Um, chances are that her her opinions have been formed by a terrible amount of misinformation. Mm-hmm. So it's to me, in my mind, looking at it from the perspective of whether or not it's strictly speaking sin as far as God's word would would define it. I think the most helpful way to look at it is: is this helpful to your marriage? Um, right. You know, for for me personally, I love my wife dearly. I can't imagine my life without her and without my children. And if I had to make the choice myself between firearm ownership and my wife, thank God I don't have to make that choice. Thank God I'm not in that situation. Um, I treasure my wife more than my firearms. Right, and and the and the Bible makes very clear the relationship between man and wife. It doesn't make clear the relationship between you and your guns. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so, imagine. Let's take this this letter. Um, imagine that you that this couple is a member of your your parish, and the, and they come to you for counseling on this issue. How do you counsel them as a couple? What do you, how do you counsel the husband who's adamant he wants the gun? And how do you counsel the wife who's adamant she doesn't? I would go to Ephesians 5 for this. You know, I mentioned earlier I wanted to go into a little more detail, so here we go. Um, starting with verse 22, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And that verse was also listed in the table of duties. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. You know, and this is one of those typical passages that at least any pastor worth his salt should go through uh, during premarital counseling or God forbid if you're counseling a couple who is having a conflict in their marriage when you're when you're going through just regular ordinary marital counseling. Um, the key there is where Paul says, wives submit to your husbands as to the Lord. So the wife is to uh, understand that her submission to her husband isn't just a blind submission, you know, to the point of practical slavery, but she is submitting to her husband in the same way that one would submit to the loving care of Christ. Okay. And then conversely, Paul then continues, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So if the husband 
is loving the wife with an unconditional, self-sacrificing, self-giving love, the kind of love that is willing to, where he's willing to lay down his life to, to save his wife to, 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 for her temporal salvation. Um, any husband other who thinks that he can do anything for his wife's eternal salvation besides pray for her and lead her to Christ, uh, you're out of your mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, so the, the husband is to care for his wife Insofar as he is able, you know, of course, we're all limited because of our sinful nature, but insofar as he is able to care for his wife in the same manner that Christ cares for his, the church, being willing to lay down his life for her to love her unconditionally, that is the kind of love and compassion that any godly woman should be able to willingly submit herself. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this this command for wives to submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, it doesn't say wives submit to your husbands even when he is asking you to submit to his own selfish desires. So when you look at it from this perspective, and if I was counseling this couple, my admonition to her would be your husband deeply desires to care for you to the extent that if need be, he would lay down his life for you. That his desire to own firearms, yes, it has something to do with his desire just to own firearms for the sake of owning firearms, because let's face it, they're fun. Um, (laughs) The, uh, that his desire is also connected to this deep need to care for you, to protect for you, if necessary, lay down his life for you. Is that the kind of love that you're willing to submit to? Um, To also look at it from the one flesh uh, aspect that you desire to care for your husband. You know, this is something that is near and dear to his heart. Do you in love acquiesce to his desire simply because you love him more than you hate guns? I, I would hope that any wife out there loves loves her husband more than she hates guns, <laughs> um, you know. And, and then for the husband, um, that to, to have his obligation to care for his wife, for him at the same time to understand that his desire to care for his wife doesn't have an absolute necessity of purchasing and owning and keeping a firearm in the home. Um, to to have you know m- my advice in a situation like this would be um, ask the wife to have an open mind, but at the same time expect you know and even if they had to draw up some sort of written contract that that the the husband would promise to keep these firearms secured at all times when they're in the home, um, whether it's secured on his person or secured in a safe that is inaccessible to to their child. You know, when I walk into somebody's house and their, their gun cabinet is one of these nice Oak cabinets with the glass and just a little, you know, key lock to keep the door (laughs) shut. You know, it's like, well, it's, it's a good thing. I'm a law abiding Christian because if I was a thug who wanted to acquire guns, your house would be the first one I come to. (laughs) Right. So, so, so to have it wrapped in that where, where he, because he has also a desire to care for his wife and that one flesh union ought to give him a sincere desire to consider his wife's apprehension to this, mm-hmm. that he would take the necessary steps to say, okay, I'm, I'm getting trained on, on proper gun safety. I'm going to buy the gun safe before I even buy the gun so that, you know, we're not, I'm not putting you or our children at risk by having an unsecured firearm in the home. Um, you know, it's, right. I'm not saying it's going to work in every situation. You're, you're still going to have those wives out there who have been so indoctrinated either through the education system or the political system or the media that they're so anti-gun that nothing you say is ever going to change their mind. Um, again, that's when you have to ask your question, do you love guns more or your wife more? Um, mm-hmm. But uh, that's, you know, I based on what you read at the start of this, I wouldn't, I would still be optimistic throughout the process of counseling them to uh, 
hopefully a, a positive result. All right. So let, before we wrap this up, let's reverse the roles. I suspect this would be rare, but let's play it out. Let's say the wife wants a gun because she works in a dangerous part of town or she's taking night classes or, you know, she works late. She's home at, uh, alone a lot while the husband is away on business, maybe. But the husband is one of these David Hogg beta males who is opposed <laughs> to guns. How do you counsel that couple in this case? The husband is the head of the home, says no. What do you say to them? I'd look the guy straight in the eyes and tell him to grow up here. <laughs> um, you know, and that's in Hezekiah 36, right? Yes. Yes. And um, the Lord saith, grow up here. <laughs> no, it's that would be, you know, and of course, this isn't completely unforeseen because there are situations out there where, yeah, you do have, you know, a beta male out there who managed to, you know, somehow attract a, a godly woman who seems to have more balls than he does. <laughs> <laughs> um, you don't have to edit that out, by the way. <laughs> No, I thought I'd leave that in. I've got two bloopers now. <laughs> um, to remind him of his duty to protect and care for his family. And that by having this opposition, which is founded on this apprehension that's based on irrational fear that he's allowing this to get in the way of his wife being possibly placed in a situation where she cannot protect herself. Mm -hmm. Is he willing to lose his wife over his political convictions? Right. Um, if he was to say yes, I would not have any hope for that marriage. Right. But you know, it's, to remind him of his obligation to protect and care for his wife and children. And, you know, and again, this is one of those situations where it's helpful to know the statistics when it comes to things like accidental firearm deaths, that to demonstrate that, you know, you have a greater chance of, of dying from falling than you do from being accidentally shot with a firearm. This isn't going to make your home somehow a more dangerous place because that's the argument we almost always hear is that, oh, by bringing a firearm into the home, you're automatically making it a danger zone. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's good to be armed with the facts, the statistics that clearly demonstrate that the converse is the truth. That no, you're not at, more at risk by having a firearm in the home. Assuming that you are being responsible, you know, if, right. if you've got, you know, eight kids from the ages of, you know, three to 15 and you leave that uh, fully loaded, cocked and locked 1911 sitting on your nightstand 24 um, seven, not only are you a moron, but you're just asking for trouble. <laughs> Very true. All right. So to wrap this up, final thoughts on this, uh, on this question, on this topic. You know, if you find yourself in this situation, uh, go to your pastor first, you know, with or without your wife. And in many cases, it's good to give your pastor a heads up before you are, uh, you have your wife there with you so that he has some time to think about this because it's possible that your pastor has not had the time to think about this. Um, if your pastor is anti-gun, find a new church <laughs> <laughs> because you won't yeah, have pastor won't help. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. If, if your pastor is the shanky O'Toole type, uh, he's, he's not going to be on your side. Um, <laughs> If your pastor is a David Anderson type, that you know he's just a heretic on the other side of the spectrum. Uh, right. So, um, you know, it's it's find a pastor that is going to be supportive of this, um, and he ought to be supportive of this is if he is taking his biblical role as a pastor seriously. Um, mm -hmm. That that he you know Lord willing wouldn't be putting politics ahead of the scriptures because 
As we've discussed ad nauseum, the scriptures in no way prohibit ownership of firearms. Right. But but that's where I would start. I would start with, with seeking the advice of your pastor and then being very gentle and compassionate with your wife, expressing this as coming from a place of deep concern for her. And, you know, if she's apprehensive to to gently co I wouldn't say coerce, I can't think of a better word, but but to gently lead and guide her to to show her that please, you know, out of love for me, I am asking you to at least keep an open mind. You know, and you know, my wife, she still does not like guns. Um, she's just not comfortable with them. She's not anti-gun. Um, mm-hmm. I, I love my wife dearly, and I am very much appreciative of the fact that she is not opposed to me owning firearms. Although whenever she asks me how many more guns do you need, my experience, response is always just one more. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's uh, be gentle, be compassionate, be caring. If you try to run roughshod over your wife, uh, you're practically committing marital suicide at that point. Right. And be prepared to, to do the hard work to prove to your wife that you are going to be responsible as a gun owner. It's not something you can just say, I'm going to be safe. You've got to do, you've got to do the work to prove it. Right. You know, and, and just having that conversation with your wife that, you know, this is something that I have a deep desire to do. And I'm asking if you will go along with me on this to, you know, to a class or something so that, you know, just so that you can see what it's about. Cause I think it'd be good for both of us to learn something here. And, you know, this could be good for building our marriage, the building a relationship with one another, that we're doing something together and then take it one step at a time. Um, yeah. You know, it's, you don't have to introduce your wife to, you know, shooting a 30 out six for the first gun she pulls a trigger on to start her off with a 22 and show her that it can be fun and enjoyable as long as it's done responsibly. Absolutely. All right. Well, I think that wraps it up. Pastor, thank you so much for doing this. As always, it has been a joy. And for those of you listening, if you have any comments or any questions, please visit our feedback page at armedlutheran.us slash feedback. Send us an email, a voicemail, or a voice message. We'd love to hear from you and respond to your, to your comments or questions on the air. Tune in again next time for another edition of Clinging to God and Guns right here on Armed Lutheran Radio. John Bennett is the pastor at St. John's Lutheran Church in Willow Creek, Minnesota. For more information, visit stjohnswillowcreek.org. And that's going to wrap it up for this week's show. Thank you all for listening, for downloading, for subscribing. Thank you to our fine sponsors who make all this possible. Thank you to my awesome cast of contributors. And thank you, dear listener, for listening, for downloading, for subscribing. I hope you'll join us again next week. Until then, keep shooting, keep praying. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Armed Lutheran Radio. For show notes, be sure to visit our website at www.armedlutheran.us. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, and tune in. This podcast is made possible by Cook's Holsters and contributions from listeners like you.